Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, with that, we come to Symposium 4 on Disagreement and Conflict. Three very experienced speakers. Uh, the first one is Dominic himself. And I overheard yesterday that he didn't want any more introductions. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep it very short and instead narrate a, my own Dominic story, which he has heard, but many of you haven't. So when I was kind of uh, leaving my previous job in 2013 and coming to Singapore, my colleagues gave me a book as a present, signed with you know the whole department's name. And that was authored by Dominic, Death or Disability, The Clementist Machine, Decision-Making and Critically Ill Children. And uh, that book has been kind of John Lantos, the guru of bioethics, has said that it is the best book on pediatric bioethics. So highly recommended. Thank you. And for that, you will always be on my office shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so the first speaker is Dominic. Over to you. Well, you're, you're, very, you're very kind. You're probably too kind, Vijay. Uh, so, uh, but if I, if I get to my conflict of interest slide, that there are a couple of books which might have been mentioned already, which I haven't got for sale here. But if you're interested, um, and it includes one on, on conflicts of uh, conflicts and treatment decisions. I, I was a bit worried um, following Roz's beautiful talk that she was giving the kind of long detailed backstory movie and I was going to be left with doing one of those kind of Marvel shorts that <laughs> it's kind of got the characters but you know the characters and worse than that it's just kind of rerunning material that you already saw in the movies. You think you're going to get some new stuff but actually it's stuff you already know but thankfully she did leave a couple of things for me to talk about so um, so I, I'm going to recap a couple of bits, uh, just do a tiny bit of revision, but, but we've already covered it. So, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll get into some stuff that, that might be able to build helpfully on, on what Ros has talked about. So we, we've talked uh, lots about decision-making for children, this uh, presumption that we're aiming to act in the best interests of children, um, but that we need to supplement a best interest model because it doesn't seem to leave parents within any say in decisions, and notwithstanding my, my views yesterday, I think parents are really important in decisions, just not all decisions. Um, so they do have a role within the zone of parental discretion. We've heard lots of, lots of discussion about that. Uh, and my, uh, my way, is, as you've already seen, for, for my preferred model is, uh, it actually has the proper colors today, um, uh, is, is thinking about these decisions in, in, in this, with this sort of graph, so we've got Decisions at the top that we wouldn't allow parents to refuse, that we will provide even if parents are adamant that the child won't have it, that's the blood transfusion. The ones in the middle, uh, in between the harm threshold that we might think of as the zone of parental discretion. Uh, and the, the ones down below that we often use the F word, talk about futile treatments, um, uh, that we're not going to provide even if parents wish for it. So, so we've got, that, that is our background, that, that's taken as a given, you've heard all about that in, in much more detail. So how do we think about conflict ethically uh, and practically um, with, with that as a background? Well, well one, thing that we allude, what, one thing that was alluded to in the questions is that there are, although often as professionals we like talking about, or we don't like it very much, but we talk a lot about these situations where we disagree with parents, um, and that certainly occurs. It's the minority of situations, the, these Big high profile cases make them seem more common than they are. This, I often quote this paper by Edward Verhagen, which suggested that in 10% of end of life decisions in the, in the US, uh, there was disagreement or conflict about them, but that in all of those cases, uh, they were able to be resolved with time. So, so uh, none of those cases went to, went to court. The, the other thing that I, they are, that I often say uh, as a kind of useful way of capturing what happens when there's conflict between parents and professionals is that they only e can end in one of five possible ways. These are my five C's. Uh, so one of them, Roz mentioned it, which is capitulation, so the doctors give up and do what the parents say. Uh, the other is conversion, that we convince, conversion or convincing, that we convince the parents to do what we say. The third is what's been alluded to already, compromise, so you settle on something, it's not really what you want as professionals, but it's something that's within the zone of parental discretion. Sometimes uh, what is euphemistically called the child deciding or crisis, which is 
something bad happens and then the decision becomes irrelevant, usually the child's died, um, or you go to court. And those, those are the, actually, can see, as far as I can see, the only ways that, that these conflicts can possibly resolve. I've never seen any good statistics on that kind of divides conflicts in, in, into those, but I think that, that's, that's a great study that needs to happen. Anyway, conflicts between parents and, and doctors are one type of conflict, but actually, if you ask professionals, many pediatric professionals will describe having experienced conflict, but two-thirds of the conflicts they describe are conflict between professionals, and only one-third of the conflicts with parents. So there's quite a lot more conflicts out there when doctors and surgeons are disagreeing about what, uh, what should happen, or surgeons and surgeons. Or, or, or. Um, and I have a little bit to say about, about that, but uh, as Ros mentioned, often our, our ethical focus is on these disagreements between parents and clinicians. As Ros has already mentioned, there are often these two different species of conflicts, the refusal cases and the, and the request cases. And we often start with this, this uh, question, would it be harmful to do what the parents are requesting? And we've heard already this uh, very important principle, the, the harm threshold, which comes uh, partly out of uh, political philosophy, John Stuart Mill, but much more recently uh, being deployed a lot, uh, though not everybody agrees with that we sh this is what we should be using for decision making. So that, that's, a, I think, a, a useful starting point when we're thinking about these conflicts. But, but I think it is also helpful to, to ask some additional questions. So one of them um, is, and we might think about Paul. So, so Ros talked about her view about the Katie's case, but didn't tell us what she thought about Paul's case. And I thought that was very helpful for me, because I'm going to take Paul as our example. Remember, this is the 10-day-old baby who, by the sounds of things, has got a, a serious underlying genetic problem as well as hyperplastic left heart. Uh, and certainly in my place, the surgeons would be extremely unenthusiastic about going, going ahead with surgery. The parents are wanting surgery. So one thing that's useful to understand uh, is to understand what's the nature of the disagreement. Is this a disagreement between the professionals and the parents about the facts, about what would happen with surgery, about the nature of the child's condition, or is it a disagreement about values? Uh, and, and I'll show you in a second how, how, how we might think about that differently. I've also come to think that there's a third category that we need, which is, is this about trust? Because although it, it, it's kind of useful for academic ethicists to go away and think there's facts and values, often trust is a, is a huge issue. And that overlaps with both factual and value disagreement. Often where there are value disagreements, the parents don't trust the professionals. But particularly, even uh, if there's factual disagreement, often that arises from situations of distrust. And, and our ability to deal with that is, is often very hampered. So, but if, if we set the trust issues aside, the idea is if, the, if there's a, a factual disagreement, we can do something about that. We can go and get more facts. We can, if there's a question about what's the prognosis of this genetic syndrome, we can go and look at the literature. For example, to use an example that Julian was mentioning yesterday, if this child has got trisomy 18, we could go and look and see, has anybody embarked on hyperplastic left heart surgery in the context of trisomy 18 or in the specific genetic uh, syndrome that, that, uh, that is at stake. Or we could get extra opinions. We could get extra scans, extra brain scans, for example, if there's a question about the child's cognitive capacity. So we could get more information. If it's a factual disagreement, getting more facts will be helpful. But it's a, if it's a value disagreement, it doesn't matter how many tests that you do, you're not going to be able to, to deal with that. So that can be helpful. Understanding the parents' reasoning, Ros uh, pointed out, sometimes is not the most important thing. But if we can see that there's a factual or a value-based disagreement, that might help us to, to work out whether we're going to be able to resolve it. So separating facts from values is useful. Second, and again this came out in question time, is that we need to have a think about what's the reason that the professionals don't want to do what the parents are asking. Um, often, as clinicians, what we wave around are a series of, of terms um, that are not terribly 
transparent about what exactly the reason is. So we say it's not clinically appropriate to do cardiac surgery, to do hypoplastic left heart surgery in a child with trisomy 18. Or we might say it's futile, again, to use the, the F word, or it would be uh, not, not medically indicated. We, we could use any one of these euphemisms. But there are fundamentally two good ethical reasons for declining to pro provide a procedure that the parents are wanting. One is that it would be harmful to the patient, would be harmful to Paul in this case. The other is that it would be harmful to other patients, and principally through use of scarce resources. Now, identifying that there are these two reasons, we can then think about uh, when we should overrule parents, and also how we might work out where that harm threshold is. So, so as Ros alluded, Working out where the harm threshold is is difficult. If our reason, if the surgeon's reason, if our, our intensivist's reason for not wanting to, to perform surgery in this, this baby with hyperplastic left heart is, con is concerned for the harm to Paul, we might try and, to, and look at his interests and how they might be set back. But one of the things that Julian and I alluded to, and this may helpfully take us back to this question of professional disagreement, is that we may be in a situation where actually there are different views about whether it would be harmful to embark upon surgery in this context. Professionals with all the relevant facts who are thinking deeply about what would be best for this individual might not have the same view. Might say, well, uh, there's a, perhaps we could do uh, some form of uh, palliative surgery. It wouldn't necessarily be harmful. Be terrible if perhaps he got stuck on the ventilator forever, but that's not a foregone conclusion. So we might have a situation where there's what I would call professional dissensus rather than consensus. Often, often what we do when we have these meetings, either um, MDTs or our clinical ethics meetings, we look for agreement, for consensus. But actually the nature of these cases is such that very often there's disagreement. But disagreement's not a failure. It's not the end of the world if we can't all agree. What that points to is uncertainty. Often in these cases there's medical uncertainty, but more importantly there's moral uncertainty about how to weigh up the unpleasantness of putting this child through surgery versus the uncertainty of the benefits that he would gain from it. The uncertainty about whether he would survive to get home from hospital, the possibility that he would enjoy some significant time with his parents. If there is such a disagreement, one of the, the arguments that we make in the book that Julian and I wrote from a point of disagreement about ethics, conflict and medical treatment in children was that we ought to, in that situation, regard ourselves as being within the zone of parental discretion. So reasonable disagreement actually has a key role in our view in thinking about when we're in the zone of parental discretion. If, if there's reasonable disagreement, and we say more in the book about what, that, what we mean by that, even if I think that treatment would be harmful, I think it would be a bad idea to embark on this surgery, if when I've heard all my colleagues and there's reasonable disagreement and our reason for not performing the procedure is, but is concern for harm for the patient, then we ought to think there's, look, there's potential benefit there. We ought to err on the side of siding with the parents. But if our reason for being opposed to surgery is a different one, if it's harm to other patients, then we need a different approach. What we're talking about here, and highly relevant to, to a number of those in this audience where resources are extremely limited, both cardiac surgery resources, and we had some, some, of, some discussion about that, but also intensive care, is that treatment of this patient, embarking on surgery, particularly prolonged intensive care for this patient, will mean that other patients won't be able to get into intensive care. And Embarking on that in the setting of professional disagreement is a completely different cup of tea. Now, cost to treatment, resource allocation are beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, and although we might, as clinicians, want to resist that, we might say, we might, somebody, some in the audience might say, you can't put a price on life. The reality is, as I've alluded already, that many health systems struggle all the time, have to make decisions about what we can provide, and we have to grapple with with real conditions of, of scarcity. In that setting, we might again, as, as a group of professionals, decision makers, come together and we might, in this situation, all agree 
that treatment would be reasonable to offer within our health system, within what the resources that we have available. We might all disagree, or we, we might all agree that it's not appropriate to provide surgery for hyperplastic left heart for this child with, for example, trisomy 18, in the context of the scarce resources uh, that, we, that we're in, or we may disagree. But in either of these latter two situations, we ought not to be providing our scarce resources. We, we need a, a higher bar for providing scarce resources. So in that situation, we should be aiming for consensus. So just to, just to recap what I've talked about uh, in this very short, Marvel short version of, of uh, uh, an approach to conflict, um, I've said we should think about harm. That's very important. But we might also recognize that disagreement and dissensus can be a valuable observation. Uh, we ought to be clear. Resources is a real consideration. It's a very fundamental ethical consideration. We ought to separate it from those concerns about interests. It's going to lead us in different directions. If our reason is resource allocation, we might say, in this, in, in this intensive care unit, we're not going to offer this. If you ha are able to fund it elsewhere, take it elsewhere, we're not going to oppose it. If our reason is interest, if we think this is the wrong thing for the child, actually, we shouldn't be su supporting the parents to go elsewhere and find treatment elsewhere. I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much.